Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. A discussion with filmmaker John J. Valadez about his award-winning Latino documentary series featured on PBS and find out about a project dedicated to the understanding of cultural performance in the borderlands. All this straight ahead on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Filmmaker John J. Valadez has been writing, producing, and directing award-winning nationally broadcast documentaries for PBS and CNN for the past 18 years. This week, Valadez was in Arizona screening two of his Latino documentary films, Prejudice and Pride, and War and Peace for ASU's Comparative Border Studies Initiative. Both of these films were part of the PBS documentary series, Latino Americans. We'll talk to John Valadez in a moment, but first, here's a short trailer of one of the films, War and Peace. In the early 1940s, while serving aboard the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise, enlisted man Charles Wheeler heard some unlikely news about a new officer. I heard about one of our new pilots that come aboard ship, that he was a Mexican boy. And I thought, I ain't believing that. Wheeler, too, had Mexican ancestry but he'd never seen a Mexican-American pilot until he met Ensign Manuel Gonzalez from California. They soon grew close. We bonded uh, over our Mexican background and it was like having a new friend. Join me now as award-winning filmmaker, John J. Valadez. John, welcome to Horizonte. Hey, thank you for having me. And, and when we say that you've been at this for, for a while and. Uh, produced a number of award-winning films. Your first one was also uh, an award winner. Tell us a little bit about that one. Well, when I was in film school, it was my student project. Uh, I started making a film about a guy who was in upstate New York who had been in prison for 19 years, eight of those in solitary confinement, and he was claiming that he had been framed by the FBI, that the FBI during the 1960s and 70s had a secret program called the Counterintelligence Program that was aimed at destroying political dissent in the United States. And so I started making a film about this guy while he was in prison. And in the middle of making it, me you know, and the other students making this film, uh, he gets released because of prosecutorial misconduct in his case, and he walks out a free man after 19 years. Essentially, the judge was saying, yeah, there was monkey business in his case, and he had been wrongly convicted. And this was uh, the epic story of, of, of his life, how he ended up in prison, what happened to him about this secret government program. And uh, the film went on to receive a primetime national broadcast on the PBS series POV and uh, was nominated for an Emmy. And he was a Black Panther. He was a leader of the Black Panther Party in New York, yeah. Now, in one way or another, most of your work has had something to do with, with political, controversial uh, topics, including the two films that, uh, that we're going to talk about that aired this week, or were screened this week at, at, at ASU. Let, let's talk about the first one. Yeah, so uh, which one? War and Peace. War and Peace. Uh, War and Peace really tells the story of Latinos in World War II how half a million Latinos fought during that war, um, how they were the most decorated ethnic group of any in the entire country during World War II, how they fought in every major battle, whether it was Iwo Jima or the Bataan Death March, storming the beaches of Normandy, facing down Rommel in North Africa, liberating concentration camps. And yet, when they returned back home, the United States was still a segregated country. They had to go to Mexican schools. They were segregated from restaurants, from public facilities. Uh, for many Mexican Americans, they did, could not get access because of the bigotry of the time to the GI Bill, that great program that brought millions of Americans from the working class to the middle class, got them into college, uh, got them into uh, homes in the suburbs. And Mexican Americans, for the most part, were left behind. And, and the film covers both the, their contributions during the war and their treatment afterwards. Yeah, and I think what it is really is that uh, after fighting and bleeding and in some cases dying for this country, uh, they expected to be treated like other Americans. And so there was a war abroad against fascism, but then there became a second war at home 
against discrimination and bigotry here in our own country. Now you and I talked a little bit off camera and, and, and we discussed the Ken Burns series of a few years ago about World War II and, and you said this was not intended to be a response to that but it certainly highlights the oversight of the contributions Latinos made. Yeah, well I think oversight is a kind word. Um, you know, Ken Burns did a, what was it, a multi-part series, 12 hours or something, right? That purported to tell the story of the greatest generation, right? The nation at war and what we went through as a country. And yet when he came out with the series, there were no Latinos included in that. Um, even though uh, half a million of us fought. And it was not an oversight so much. I mean, that, that, that's one way of putting it. But um, on some level, in some way, we were excluded. We were cut out. We were not counted. Uh, we were not um, brought into the fold as part of the American narrative. And it's not just Ken Burns. You know, American broadcast television began back in 1939. Okay, that's before World War II. So we've had broadcast television for over 74 years. And it isn't until PBS did this series, Latino Americans, that the story of Latinos and their participation in this greater American drama has been told on national television. And if, you know, I don't know how you grew up, but when I grew up, there was, uh, I don't think I ever heard of a Latino in the history books when I was in elementary or middle school or high school. It was as though our contributions didn't matter, as though we were somehow foreign, as though we were not part of the American experience. Before we talk about the other film that you did for this series, Prejudice and Pride, let's talk about the series itself. And, and do you think it actually tells the story that's been needed to be told? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I think we did a, I think we did a great job. Um, the series is six hours. It begins basically before the U.S.-Mexico War when, when a huge swath of the United States, Arizona included, was actually part of Mexico. Back right? 1846, 1848. Right, the, right, right, the Mexican-American War of 1848. So it starts prior to that. And, um, and so when, when I was growing up, we were taught history as an east-west enterprise, right? There are people, a string of colonies on the east coast, and they gradually moved westward, and that was the westward expansion, manifest destiny, and that was the story of America. But there are other ways of envisioning the past and, 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 and to look at how Latinos lived in this land, right? Arizona, Texas, California, and then how we were incorporated into the United United States is a, is, a, is a really riveting saga um, of who we are and it adds more nuance and uh, complexity to the American experience. It's, it's one heck of a good story. Before we get into detail on your other film, give us a, a brief overview of the other four films that are part of the series. Okay, well the, the, the first film is really before uh, the uh, U.S.-Mexico War and then talks about the U.S.-Mexico War and its, and its aftermath. The next film kind of goes, we go to the eastern seaboard more or less and we talk about Cubans and Puerto Ricans and the legacy of colonialism and, uh, and the relationship with uh, the Caribbean. And then the next film, which would be our three, is, uh, well, is, uh, is this film about World War II. And then hour four, we hop back over to the East Coast. And again, we talk about uh, Puerto Ricans and Cubans, but pick them up in the 1950s and the 1960s, right? And then we hop back over and we talk about the Chicano movement of the 1960s and 70s. Which is your film. Which is also my film. And then the final film is really about I guess what I would call the Great Migration. During the 1980s and 1990s, this country saw the largest influx of immigrants in the nation's history. About 22 million people came into the country, mostly from Latin America. And it tells that story and its relationship to the Cold War and becoming American and how the demographic shift begins and the reshaping of the American soul as we move into the 21st century. And, and what kind of reception has the series received from the public at large? Well, I've done about, I'd say about 40 screenings um, across the country, mostly in the Southwest. And I'll tell you, uh, they've been phenomenal. 
They've been really phenomenal. You know, this series is not something, I mean, I, you know, you look at the history of Latinos in this country, and at times it is painful. At times it is agonizing. At times it is ugly. But at times it's beautiful. And it's something to be really proud of. And I think what it reveals is it reveals that Latinos are like everybody else, that we hold in common uh, the bonds of what it means to be American, a belief in democracy. And I assume everything you just said applies, uh, if not uh, as strongly, maybe even more strongly so, to, to your second film, Prejudice and Pride, the story of the Chicano movement. Absolutely. The story of the Chicano movement, at least in my telling, is really the story of a people who exist on the ragged periphery of American society. Remember that in 1960, right, the uh, median level of education for Mexican Americans in this country was just eight years. Okay, and when we talk about, we open with the, with the farm workers struggle in California. Remember that in the early 1960s, the average life expectancy for a migrant field worker in California was 49 years, okay? And the vast majority of those people could neither read nor write. And so you're talking about people who are really marginalized in a very, very uh, brutal way. And so it's the story of, of, of these folks who are on the ragged edge of society and how they fight their way within the system, right? Fight their way so that they can get closer to the center of power, so that they can redefine what it means to be American, and so that they can gain their civil rights and full participation in American society. And it's an extraordinary uh, uh, and beautiful, beautiful story. It's also the story of, of uh, the rising consciousness among the college students, Ch Chicano college students, um, and, the, and the birth of the Chicano movement. Yeah, well, you know, I had a revelation when I was making the film. Um, the film's dedicated to Sal Castro, who led the student walkouts in Los Angeles. And when I was making the film, I, I have a large library of books. I'm an avid reader. And, uh, and I was reading a, a, a book one day, and I was you know, thinking about Mexican-American history and trying to figure out, how do I make this film, right? And, and it just occurred to me, well, what year was this book published? So I, I flipped to the beginning, and it was 1972. And so then I put the book down, I grabbed another one, and I flipped, and it was 1980, and I grabbed another one, 1996, grabbed another one, 2004. Every book, with a few exceptions, but very few, every book on my entire shelf about Mexican-American history was written after 1968. Before 1968, there were almost no books that chronicled the experience of Mexican Americans in this country, we and had so been, you think that was a result of the Chicano movement bringing bringing attention to this history. Well, of, of well, not people. just attention, right? Not just attention, because what happened was those students walked out of schools in California, in Arizona, in New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Kansas, Michigan, Illinois, Texas. Right? They walked out and they demanded number one that they get the same quality education that white students were getting. And they also demanded more Mexican-American teachers. But their third demand, this is the key one, they wanted the experience of Mexican-Americans to be incorporated in the curriculum. Well, what they found out was that there were no books. So those students graduated from high school. They went to colleges, right? And they founded over 160 Mexican-American Chicano ethnic studies programs across the country. And they went, and they went into the archives, they did the research, they talked to the old people, and they wrote the history. And they began to construct the story and weave the experience of Mexican Americans into that grand story of America. And that was a gift, not to Mexican Americans. It was a gift to this country, because Mexican American history is American history. We are one and the same. We're bound together in a way that is inextricable and can never be unbound. And so they gave us a more nuanced and complex and complete understanding of who we are as a people. As do the films that, that uh, you've been screening and uh, will be screening this week in, at ASU and other places. John Valadez, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. To talk about it. Thank you. Much appreciated.
And what happened in Lemon Grove, which is just a tiny little community outside of San Diego, was that the school board decided to set up a separate school for the Mexican children of the district. Uh, this was at a point where the Mexican children now comprised almost a, major a majority of the students in the, in the school. The, the numbers had been increasing. And uh, much to the surprise of the school board, the Mexican-American community uh, decided to fight this. They were, they were uh, unhappy when they learned about it. The school board actually was not very forthcoming in even letting them know this was going to happen. But when so they I understand the students just showed up one day and then they were told they had to go to, uh, to the other school, which was basically a barn. Exactly. It was like hardly even a school. And essentially then the, the Mexican-American community essentially instructed their children not to attend this other school. And I think those are th that's the class or some of the students who were... Right. That's a, that's a picture of the class from one of the classes from this, from this time period. Supermercado de Walmart is the company's newest creation, a grocery store servicing the Latino community from already prepared food to traditional products. But behind all the ethnic items is a greater strategy servicing the needs of the company's fastest growing consumers. It's a natural evolution of our, let's say, start the community program where we're trying to have what the community is looking for. So, you know, as you know, we already have stores in Latin America, stores in the U.S., so we learn in both, let's say, arenas, and this is a blend of maybe both worlds. Mr. Buffett, thank you for joining us today. Um, you've written six books of photography, a, a seventh on the way. I'd like to talk about your most recent one, Tapestry of Life. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Tapestry of Life is really kind of a, a combination of probably about 40 international trips and, and a few domestic trips. And it's just an effort to really kind of show through, basically through photography and images, uh, what's happening around the world and what some of the challenges are for different people, different cultures, different traditions. And, uh, you know, some might be very different from what we would see here in the United States, and then there might be some that are similar in certain specific areas. Performance in the Borderlands is a community partnership in the ASU Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts in the School of Film, Dance, and Theater. Here to talk about this project and an event coming <coughs> up dedicated to music and dialogue is Mary Stevens. Mary is pr a producing director for Performance in the Borderlands and a lecturer for the ASU School of Film, Dance, and Theater. Also, here is Dr. Michelle Tellez, co-founder of Entre Nosotras Group. She is also an assistant professor for the ASU School of Humanities, Arts, and Culture Studies. Thank you both for joining us Thank on Horizonte to talk about this. We just finished talking to John Valadez, who uh, is, is part of a PBS series that tells the story of, of, uh, of Mexican Americans. And it, it just seems so appropriate to, to have you guys on to talk about how that story is still going on. Michelle, give us a little bit of a sense of, of uh, performance in the borderlands. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Phillips, um, um, uh, uh, Stevens rather. There's a Mary Phillips I have in my head, Mary no Stevens. No worries. Um, I can uh, uh, but, but, but a sense of, of performance in the borderlands and what you're trying to accomplish with that. So performance in the borderlands is a tiny initiative in the school of film, dance, and theater. And what we focus on is bringing performance and politics or social themes together out in communities in Phoenix as a way to really address what's happening here, not only in Phoenix and Arizona broadly, but looking at the rest of the nation and globally what's happening around borders. And so a lot of our programming has to do with curating international, national, and local artists to come together to talk about work, to talk about, and to show work that is addressing political themes in some way. And when you say out in the communities, that's, that's a key component, mm -hmm. and as I understand, a change yeah. from where the program was focused before. It's been in existence since 2004, yeah. but more recently, mm -hmm. you really are going out into the community. Yeah, so we've taken in the last two years, we've moved all of the programming off of campus and brought it into different communities around Arizona and Tucson. Recently, we just did, we worked with some Tucson artists as well. Um, and that was really an initiative and, and a gesture toward believing that there are other cultural producers of knowledge that we need to be working with. So it isn't just one way. It isn't just come to the university to experience these great artists and knowledge producers, but what local people do we have that are already doing this work that we can work with and learn from as university professors, students, and, and faculty in some way. And so bringing local and national, or excuse me, national and international artists into critical proximity with 
local artists to talk about these mm -hmm. issues and work together has been a major part of, um, of this kind of difference in the last two years. And what we found is that our audiences we can't get them not to come. I mean, I can't tell you, sometimes I, I hope that only 20 people will come. I'm a little tired and we have 100 people mm -hmm. coming to events on Tuesday nights to talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the reason that performance is important is because, you know, in general, and I don't know how you feel, um, Michelle, about this, but art is about destabilizing the familiar or making the familiar strange to us. And we're gonna talk way. about some of those events where you've done uh -huh. exactly that, Mary, but before we do that, uh, uh, Dr. Teas, a little bit about Entre Nosotros, it's relatively new. Absolutely, yes, thank you. Um, so Entre Nosotros is a collaboration between students. Literally meaning between us, but uh, between yeah. women. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and it's between students, faculty members, uh, across the campuses, sort of embodying that idea of one university in many places. and. We created this, it was born out of a little bit about one of my classes um, on Gender in the Borderlands. And we decided we wanted to really speak to issues that pertain to the Chicano Latino transnational community, talk about issues, but bring them into conversation um, in different mediums, right? So to have the lectures, but to bring films, to bring artists, to bring musicians, mm -hmm. uh, and in that way, talk about the same issues that maybe you'll read in a text, but instead create dialogue to listen to music, to talk about stories through song, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so that's been the idea. And over a year, I think we've been pretty successful. We're, you know, we're, we're barely starting. We're, we don't really, we're, we're autonomous, I think, in some ways, right? We're part of the university, but we, and we work across these campuses. But we're really, the idea is also to bridge the academy with the community. But right? you've got a, a very neat event coming <clears throat> up. We're going to talk about yes. that in some detail. But before we do that, uh, Mary, some of the events you've done, mm -hmm. uh, we've got some pictures of them. Uh, one of them is Desierto Remix. Yeah. Uh, we'll have that on the screen in a second. But, but tell us about this. It's a very striking photo. Yeah, it is a beautiful photo. It was an amazing event. Um, the Desierto Remix was a collaboration with Cassandra Hernandez and the Deer Valley Rock Art Center um, in the North Valley, about 25 miles north of Phoenix. And what we did was we were working with a group of Colombian street artists, a group of 14 stilt walkers that use Bouteau performance to get into this conversation around people that have died before us through things like genocide um, and bringing them here and placing them on um, a Native American sacred site of migration. So there's um, rock art all over Deer Valley. And so really creating this conversation between audiences, seeing this work as they're walking through the desert, following this group called Nem Katakoa on stilts. And they're in this, and you can see from the image, they're in this like white kind of ghostly um, kind of costume. And then on the sacred site, which in some ways has a lot of resonance with people that have come before us, genocide, who, where do we go next? Mm -hmm. um, and then as we're walking through, remembering we are in this desert place, and what does it mean to be desert dwellers in 2013? Mm. How are we sustainable now? How do we treat the past? How do we treat the present? Where is our future going? Um, and again, an unprecedented showing, 200, almost 250 people came out to a fairly unknown place to see this work. And, and so. we've got a couple of other pictures mm -hmm. we want to get up quickly. One is sure. uh, Breaking Boundaries. Yeah, Breaking Boundaries. Yeah, this is Breaking Boundaries, again, co-produced with um, a dear friend and colleague, Cassandra Hernandez. Um, and this was a panel discussion about arts and mm -hmm. social engagement. And again, 250 people at Phoenix Center for the Arts, again, bringing it off of campus into communities to have an interesting and dynamic conversation. And I have to say, one of the things about performance in the borderlands is very important is that we really take diversity at all levels of our curation very, very serious. So we look at race and sexuality and gender and class and in they, terms of who you participates. you have another uh, series, actually, mm -hmm. that, that focuses on a very local issue in yeah. one sense, um, band plays. And we've got an uh, image that we've, we've got up here as well. Yeah, this is the band plays, and this is at the Phoenix Hostel and Cultural Center where it's usually housed, and that's right in the downtown Phoenix, not too far from this building. And what we did was um, we decided that we needed to have a response to what was happening in Tucson, and not necessarily to protest what was happening, but how can we come together around bannings of some kind? And we curated a series called The Band Plays. We work with local artists and readers, um, culture leaders, non-readers, to come together to read plays. And again, we've had 100 people at play readings on Tuesday. Nights. And, and, and Dr. Tejas, mm -hmm. you're hoping to have a good crowd for something that's coming up um, the weekend of the 15th or so. Tell us about that. It's three sure. nights of program. Yes, we're very excited about this. Uh, it's a week of Chicana artivism, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so uh, we're going to be having a lecture on Thursday evening at the West Campus and by Dr. Micaela Diaz-Sanchez. And she's going to be really thinking through the historiography of Son Jarocho. 
uh, sort of gender dynamics around performance. And that will be music from the state of Veracruz? Yes, yes, absolutely. And then on Friday evening, we're going to be bringing out the uh, band Entre Mujeres. Mm -hmm. uh, Marta Gonzalez, Dr. Marta Gonzalez, actually she just finished her PhD as well at the University of Washington. She, um, she created this project out of, um, I think, translocal dialogues, right, mm -hmm. is what she calls it. And so out of a conversation um, and, and musical and we're engagement. we're almost out of time. Tell us about the third day. Really. Oh, Saturday morning there'll be a workshop um, at Dona Tierra, and it's going to be a community workshop where we engage in the Fandango practices, in the music and collective songwriting. And we're very excited to bring out this idea where community members can participate um, in this three-day series. So these are all very exciting events, a very uh, impressive series of events for, for uh, Borderlands performance in the Borderlands. We'll have you both to, uh, back to talk at, at greater length about yeah. both of these. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for joining appreciate us. It. Thank you. And that is our show for tonight. From all of us here at Horizonte, I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.